Roche. Good morning, Serge Roche. You were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2012, Administrator of the Collège de France. You also hold the chair in quantum physics. And quantum physics, as Richard Feynman said, that no one really understands. Was this just his way of emphasizing its strangeness? Uh, certainly. Well, from Feynman's part, it's probably being overtly modest, because if someone understood quantum physics very deeply, it was him. What he meant is that it's a kind of physics that defies intuition. So you you cannot have a direct idea based on daily life uh, or based on classic physics which uh, rules the world as we know it and uh, things to which we have become used through our personal experience or even uh, through humankind's experience um, throughout evolution. So the phenomena are counterintuitive in the microscopic level. Nature behaves strangely. A particle, a grain of light can be simultaneously in several places or in several states. It's what is called the um, layering of states principle, which forms the base of the strangeness. When you say that matter does not behave in the same way and that it's counterintuitive, I think it's completely different in the macroscopic world? Yes, in the macroscopic world, the laws of logic are classic. A door is either open or shut. Two situations, two different situations, one or the other occurs, not both together. In quantum physics, a particle can take two different paths. Is this uh, the idea behind Schrodinger's image of a cat that is both alive and dead? Yes, Schrodinger had tried to imagine a situation where a small system which may exist in, a layered, in two layered states, an atom for instance, is coupled with a macroscopic object and he took a cat as he could have taken any other object composed of many particles. If the atom is in one state, the cat's alive. If it's another state, the cat dies. If both states are layered, logic would say that there is a layering of dead and alive. And Schrodinger says this situation is absurd, and he tried to point out the contradiction, or at least the difficulty of the quantum world. In quantum physics, light is both a wave and a particle. Could you explain this? Well, it's part of the strangeness of these physics. It's true of light. Light behaves as a wave and creates interference, and that has been well known since at least the early 19th century, but it's also made of discrete grains uh, which hit a screen at a given moment or different moments, and these discrete grains are what are known as photons. It's the dualism uh, between the wave aspect and the corpuscular aspect, uh, which is, forms the um, because a wave is everywhere at the same time. It has an amplitude in different places in space, and the particle associated with the wave is in several places at the same time. Einstein discussed this with Bohr and imagined what was called a photon box, a box in which you can capture a grain of light, observe the moment when it escapes from the box, and at the same time measure very precisely the energy emitted by this photon in the box. And by carrying out this experiment simultaneously, Einstein hoped to prove that there was a flaw in quantum physics. And the experiences we're carrying out today are photon box experiments. Our box is obviously um, not as crude as what Bohr and Einstein has imagined. Our photon box is a set of mirrors, facing mirrors, between which photons bounce. And we uh, project atoms through the box, and these atoms carry information about these photons as they pass through. But this information is carried in a very delicate way because the photons are not destroyed in the process. It's information that allows us to reconstruct the state of the photons in the box, to see that they are in these layered states, to measure and count the number of photons, and to observe the moment when they disappear, when they vanish, which is an original aspect. For what specific research were you awarded the Nobel Prize? So the Nobel Prize rewarded our work on the manipulation of isolated quantum systems, our capacity to isolate quantum systems and to observe and handle them without destroying them. Usually, when observing simple systems, in particle accelerators, for instance, you see how the particles behave after violent collisions, and the particles are destroyed in the process. When photons reach your eye and are detected, when you see, they are destroyed. And we have designed non-destructive, gentle methods of observation of these particles. 
Now that you've trapped light, what's the next challenge? One of the aspects of quantum physics is that the mere fact of observing a phenomenon, a system, changes the state of the system. Observation changes the state, and it's true in our experiences. The atoms that pass through the box allow us to know what state the field in the box is, but also modifies it continuously, and therefore the manipulation and observation aspects are deeply intertwined. And when manipulating and observing the light in the box, you can prepare it into strange states, layered states, where they are in two states at the same time. You can have a light field in which the light points in two opposite directions. You can create a situation in which you have both a, a field with a very large amplitude of several photons, but also is void. So there is a layering of states which classically make no sense. These states are what we call the Schrodinger cat states. Uh, where Schrodinger had imagined that a system such as an animal, a cat, could be in two different states, both alive and dead. These Schrodinger states are very brittle, very fragile, and disappear very quickly. As soon as the photon escapes the box, the information carried by the photon destroys the layered states in the box. It's the decoherence phenomenon. And we have studied this, and now, as you're asking, what is the next step? The next step is to try to avoid these effects in order to preserve as long as possible these strange states within our box, to preserve the quantum strangeness continuously. I have the impression that quantum physics is a basic science. So ultimately, all the physicists that preceded you were interested in uh, purely intellectual advances. Initially, it was purely intellectual, and this research, it's true, is very basic, fundamental. Not to say that there are not extensions and applications, but these are two different processes. You seem very attached to your freedom to work on whatever you want to, to think, ultimately. Yes, the freedom is essential. It gives, them, gives us the open-mindedness, allows us to carry out long-term, ambitious projects. And what is lacking in the, today's system is enough trust and enough time. Labs, which were very fruitful, um, that produced dozens of Nobel Prizes, such as the Bell Labs in the States, were closed down because the shareholders of the uh, telecom giant realized that for short-term profit, it was no good to maintain um, pure, purely research based on pure curiosity. It's one of the perverse effects of a system that is purely short-term and based on the law of profit and that does not acknowledge the common good uh, which does not have a monetary value and which represents, I believe, the greatness of civilization and society.